Hi, I'm Angela from Australia. I've unfortunately experienced medical gaslighting firsthand, which has not only been mentally distressing, but in my opinion, a form of emotional abuse, and dare I even say, malpractice. My name is Eleanor, and I live in Cornwall. I'm 67. I've uh, had MECFS since I was diagnosed um, in um, Middlesex. I lived many years ago. I've had it now 46 years. Hi, I'm Karin from Scotland and I was gaslit. Medical gaslighting is when doctors, specialists or nursing staff don't listen to you properly or take you seriously. Your symptoms are dismissed or downplayed and you're often made to feel silly and embarrassed for feeling the way that you do. Patients who are gaslit are usually dealt the it's just anxiety or stress card and sent on their merry way without proper tests or treatment. What do I think gaslighting is? It's being let down. It's been not listened to. It's been ignored. Your physical emotions not been taken into account. Weight, age, depression, all blamed. But never getting to the root of the problem. I understand medical gaslighting to be when a doctor tells you something is all in the mind and it isn't or tells you it's all in the mind um, as um, as a kind of lazy way of getting you out of the office without doing any tests. Um, medical gaslighting is when you're not believed by a member of the medical profession um, as to your symptoms and that might be that the symptoms you're sharing um, are not believed at all to exist or it might be that the symptoms you're sharing are minimised, that the severity of them is not believed. My experience with a, an endocrinologist who definitely gaslit me, one of a few, but this was the most important. He seemed very professional, asked questions but didn't seem to listen to them. He took numerous notes with a beautiful fountain pen. My husband was with me. I was in floods of tears. I couldn't, he just didn't listen. He just wasn't listening. He kept, if I had brought up something about my bloods and parathyroidism, he just dismissed him. And it wasn't from hyperparathyroid. It was just my age, my weight, but certainly not the end parathyroid. In my situation, I was suffering severe chest pain and shortness of breath after my COVID vaccination and kept going back to various hospitals and doctors pleading for help as my pain became more and more intense and debilitating. But I wasn't taken seriously. Instead, I was told, it's just anxiety, dearie. There's nothing wrong with you. You're stressing for nothing. Stop wasting our doctor's time. You need to see a psychiatrist. I was even injected on one occasion with an antipsychotic drug against my will. And the post-traumatic stress of the whole experience will probably haunt me forever. But I knew something was wrong with my body. So I had to learn to push back against the gaslighting and fight for answers. And I'm glad that I did because eventually it was discovered that I had developed not just one, but two inflammatory heart conditions called myocarditis and pericarditis that could have cost me my life. I was hospitalized and treated, but I should never have had to fight so hard to be believed and for a doctor to take me seriously. I'm now still stuck battling the condition years later. Will I ever get an apology for the gaslighting? I doubt it. The third thing I want to describe is my own experience of, of medical gaslighting, which is obviously what led me to uh, create a limitation of consent document. Um, yeah, I was told from the beginning that the disease was all in my head and there was no disease there, there was nothing wrong with me, all tests came back normal. Um, and, you know, this happens in the context of a what five minute maybe ten minute consult with the doctor and then you come out and you have to live with that for the rest of your life and uh, what happens is um, 
if you're a, a young person, as I was, and, and I think I went with a parent or had um, consented for them to write to my father, who was having a lot of difficulty believing there was anything wrong. Um, he was a psychologist and he was convinced illness is 90% in the mind. Um, what happens is the destruction of family relationships, basically. It doesn't necessarily happen in the first 10 minutes. But when you um, go back into your family context, quite rapidly, your um, parents, partner and children will learn that there is nothing wrong with you, in inverted commas, and that you must therefore be faking it or putting it on even if it's explained to them that psychosomatic medicine doesn't necessarily mean that, they don't hear it and they don't believe it, and they will still resent your being ill and blame you for it regardless. Um, and not only that, but that doubt spreads to every report of symptom or request for help that you give, even as your level of disability increases really badly. We had a, an example of this with our son. He has a rare adrenal condition and is under a consultant. Um, he started becoming increasingly unwell with what went on to be diagnosed as postural tachycardia. And after sort of initial blood checks that showed nothing was, nothing was wrong, I really felt I was dismissed as a fussy mother when I continued to share the problems that my son was experiencing. Um, one day we went to the GP and my son um, reported how he, he felt that his heart was racing. Uh, and because the nature of the rare condition, the GP wrote to the consultant and asked um, if my son could be perhaps fitted with a 24 hour heart monitor. Uh, this letter was on the consultant's desk when we next went for an appointment and with a sort of amused dismissive smile um, she looked at me and said and a heart monitor will not be necessary. Well, two years later my son was diagnosed with postural tachycardia and I feel if he'd had the heart monitor that would have stood a good opportunity of picking it up two years earlier. So to be dismissed in that way um, was a hard burden to bear. As a parent, you're carrying questions about your child's health, so much uncertainty, and just having a diagnosis makes all the difference. Um, and on the way to that diagnosis, you have to be believed, you have to be listened to. So to not be, um, to not be believed, um, and to have been prevented from useful monitoring really prolonged um, prolong the uncertainty and concern for another two years. Uh, in my own case, within myself, it made me hate myself with a vicious hatred, a vengeance, a vengeful hatred of myself for having invented an illness that doesn't exist, for having created an illness in my body which didn't show up in tests. I buried that hatred deep and I didn't go to doctors. I almost punished myself over it, never ever reporting to doctors that I was suffering from ME. I would wobble in and on occasion literally collapse on crutches or struggling to move a manual wheelchair and refused point blank to answer any questions about why I was disabled or limping or falling down or um, unable to even get to the surgery. I just blanked the whole lot out because there was obviously in their terms nothing wrong and um, I did my best to hide it. I did my utmost to hide any symptoms from anybody. I didn't um, uh, nearly all the time uh, unless I was very unless I was very ill, I didn't attempt to uh, get any help from anywhere. I came out in floods of tears. I had given them all the information by the, that I had. I quoted various studies, guidelines. They're not always used, but guidelines. But he took none and he hadn't seen it, so therefore it didn't exist, just because my calcium was normal.
which would have turned out to be normal systemic hyperparathyroidism. My advice for anyone going through a similar experience is always to listen to your gut instinct. Even if it does turn out to be just anxiety, you deserve to have a proper medical checkup to put your mind at ease. You deserve to be taken seriously and treated with respect and dignity. Please don't ever let them make you feel embarrassed for asking for your basic rights as a patient and remember that you are the one in control of your body. If you're not comfortable, ask for another opinion and if you're still not, ask for a third. Some other tips that help me feel more in control of the situation and might help others are to write down your symptoms and any questions that you have and take it in with you to your appointment. Take a family or friend in with you if you can too. After the appointment, I always jot down what we spoke about and I ask for copies of my blood tests and medical reports for me to keep. Remember, the doctor technically works for you. It's a service business. You wouldn't stand for a mechanic doing a bad job in your car, so why would you accept a bad job on your health and body? Try and find an online group. Often they're on Facebook. Um, perhaps try and find a condition which is nearest to what you're experiencing. And often people in those groups have gone through what you might be going through right now. And um, they can point you to the direction of doctors who can listen. I think that's one of the most important things I learned, that knowledge is not equal across the board. You have to really get to a doctor who, um, who knows what they're talking about, who will listen to you um, and will bring their expertise to, to bear on your situation with compassion. Um, so now let's talk about what patients can do to defend themselves against gaslighting, medical gaslighting, especially if they have ME-CFS or long COVID uh, leading to ME, which can, in about, I think in about half cases, it's leading to ME. Um, we can use a limitation of consent. I drafted, as far as I know, the first one during the pandemic when I had had it up to here with being gaslit by doctors over ME and also knew um, of a young woman who was very seriously ill. She had very severe ME and uh, I was hearing reports. This is, a, um, you know, a young woman who later died um, and I was hearing reports of psychiatrists coming in and asking her idiotic questions like why she was choosing to vomit. I mean, we were hearing reports of things that we would not have believed possible if they hadn't been coming from credible sources and first-hand witnesses. <laughs> um, yes. So we drew up the limitation of consent, which is a simple statement saying, I do not consent to be seen or treated by any one, meaning doctors, nurses, therapists, um, who regard ME-CFS, or you can insert long COVID instead, or as well as, um, as psychological. Now, uh, we tried it out for about a year in different people in different countries tried it and it worked. It stopped gaslighting. And then um, a barrister by the name of Valerie Elliott Smith, who has done excellent work, amazing work for the ME community, um, kindly wrote it out for us in carefully considered legal language and provided notes for guidance as well. Valerie's a barrister and we're greatly indebted to her. The template PDF can be downloaded free of charge from Valerie Elliot with one T Smith dot com. That's all one word. Valerie Elliot Smith dot com. Uh, Law and Health blog. It's on the top right of the homepage. If you read it and you're happy with the notes for guidance and the wording of the template, then you can sign and send it, hopefully with a warm and appreciative covering letter, because we need to acknowledge the fact that our doctors are genuinely very sincere and doing their best. And they're working under often appallingly difficult circumstances in the NHS. Um, and they're often under pressure of time and um, very short of resources so it's nice to acknowledge those things 
in a covering letter and to express our gratitude that they're taking the time to read this and put it on our notes. Um, but nonetheless, it is evidentiary standard and it expects um, that from then on we will only be seen or treated by doctors who are compliant with NICE NG206 and who regard the disease as biomedical. So that should cut all the gaslighting off at the knees. And apparently it does. Uh, the only um, cautions I've come across, uh, obviously some people do not have the capacity to make medical decisions about their own care and it won't be able to be useful in that situation where somebody's been de very severe ME and been deprived of liberty the hospital can do what they like to them under those circumstances and frequently do uh, and we see a lot of deaths that we believe could have been avoided as a result um, or they could uh, be in the United States which is a very litigious culture in a healthcare setting but it's, it's a litigious setting so um, it's worked out in correspondence with people using this in the states the general feeling is that it's better to write ahead a normal letter or email saying I'm looking for a doctor who approaches MECFS as a biomedical disease if you are suitable please send me an appointment and that allows the doctor to select themselves out without any um, implicit threat of litigation if they don't. So it just allows the doctors to make their own judgment. Um, and of course in practice there's often extreme difficulties finding any doctor at all who has even heard of MECFS in the States. Um, never mind any who take it seriously as a biomedical disease. However in this country things are looking up and there's now I think according to MEA's survey during the pandemic was it round about 2021 2022 2022 i think uh, there was one in six doctors in the uk surveyed uh, who understand that the disease is biomedical and it's now being taught properly in the medical schools as such um, and with the expectation that the doctors will follow the new nice guideline so things are definitely looking up here and patients should not feel helpless in the face of medical gaslighting at least for these two conditions um, and hopefully that will basically mean that the doctors who believe that the disease is psychological will be gently but firmly phased out of seeing patients who have these conditions. What can patients do? Ask questions, go prepared, write down the questions so you've got them in front of you and you won't remember. You won't forget to ask them. Take someone with you if possible. Two pairs of eyes, two pairs of ears and two mouths are much more important and can help you. But how did I get there? I studied, I read, I joined Facebook groups. I know not accepted by a lot of doctors, but without the information, factual information that I gained from these groups, and the support from groups like hyperparathyroid, hyperparathyroidism support and information, a worldwide group with thousands of members, all feel the same at the start, but have found the help and the facts and able to take copies, take things to the, the, the doctors and fight for your case. And that would apply to anything. It doesn't matter what condition. Um, but I suppose I particularly want to um, end by saying um, we don't hate doctors. I don't hate doctors. I do fear them I'm with good cause now, given the amount of devastation they've caused in my life and the disruption to my family life. Um, all in the name of so-called psychosomatic medicine, which 90% of which I think doesn't exist. It's, it's a, a, a myth, it's an idea rather than a reality. Try and be prepared, question. The days of yes doctor, no doctor, now shouldn't happen. We should be able to get the information is there. Dr Google, frowned upon by many, and yes, there are very many incorrect documents 
but there are also some very, very good ones. And you'll learn the facts. Seek a second opinion. Don't believe the first one. No matter where we are, we can get a second opinion. We are entitled to it, although a lot of doctors will try and persuade us that that's not needed and that we are, in fact, okay when we're really not. That was my experience with gaslighting and I hope that you won't be affected too. It's not always easy, but we need to keep listening to our bodies. Be brave, speak up and advocate for one another. We need to keep pushing back against medical gaslighting because it only becomes acceptable if we allow it to be.